So the move toward that 3000 is simply a technical piece where, again, you suppress the price and now the price is running because it's broken above that top. Uh, that's still 3000 will still not reflect its true fundamental value. And I did just a little quick calculation on a global basis. So here, I'll throw this out at you, Kai. Um, if you think 3000 sounded insane, how about 40000 because somebody asked me, well, what would it take to set gold behind the currencies like we're seeing what's happening in Zimbabwe? Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the at JR Mining Guy on Twitter and the CEO of the Soar Financial Group. And I really appreciate you tuning in. Maybe you've seen it on Twitter or on our YouTube post, but we've just broken 30,000 subscribers. I'm extremely thankful for that. Thank you to you. Really appreciate it. It's pushing us further and it's pushing us to work harder and, and just do a lot more interviews and be consistent in what we're doing. I really appreciate it, especially the feedback and the comments down below our videos. It's turned into a really lively community. I really appreciate that. Lots of wealth and knowledge in there. And uh, let's keep that coming. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for that. Now, without much further ado, I have a repeat guest here on the program today, and uh, it's Lynette Zhang uh, of Zhang Enterprises. Now, she's the founder and CEO of, the, of her new enterprise, and I'm really looking forward to ch ch chatting and catching up with her. Lots to, lots to talk about. We last spoke at the end of January, but since then, gold is up 25%, silver is up 35%, and we need to discuss what is happening. Who woke up? Like why why all of a sudden that move? Because we've discussed it for almost two years here on the channel that what should be happening has finally happened. And to be quite honest, I don't know why it happened. So I'm really curious what uh, my guest has to say about that. Lynette, it's great to see you again. Thank you so much for joining me here. Well, it's, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me on because it, it's true. A lot has happened in a very short period of time, but I think what's going to happen in the future will make this look like molasses. <laughs> Well, I'm really curious how this is developing because uh, Citibank is already calling for $3,000 gold, which uh, just, to be honest, six weeks ago would have sounded ludicrous, quite honestly. Like we all saw the pointers and the direction where things were headed, but nobody really dare speak about price targets like that. Anybody who came on the program, and I remember, I think it was Rob McEwen who first coined 3000 I, I might be wrong, but uh, everybody laughed at him. Now we're trading at $2,400 and... Uh, the world's largest banks are calling for 3000 it's uh it's an insane world out there Lynette and uh, please help us make sense of it because we've, <laughs> we've talked about it before like and we've talked about all the reasons why gold should be running now that gold is running and uh, you know melting up higher I think we have to explain and maybe try to understand why it is happening because I didn't see a trigger so oh. why did uh, the yellow titan wake up okay well there are there is so much to unpack in that question but i'm going to take it from the simplest place the most obvious place first because when you're talking about gold technically remember it had like basically four tops right so that means that the spot price of gold would go up to this level and then pull back and it did that four times which is very, very, very unusual. And it's really more acts like a spring, right? So if you put pressure, wait, I have a spring. Let's see. So if you put pressure on something and you hold it down because a rising gold price is an indication of a failing currency, central banks and governments do not want people to understand that that's what's happening. But the longer you hold it back, the higher that spring will go when it is released. Ah, when it is released. So what's happened from a technician's perspective is exactly what I just showed you. The price of gold had been suppressed, 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 even as global central bankers have been buying it as quickly as possible at the highest levels as possible because they certainly know what they're doing to their currency. So technically this breakout had to occur i mean personally i've been in these markets on i became a stockbroker in 1986 so a four a four uh peak top is so unusual so the move toward that 3000 is simply a technical piece where again you suppress the price and now the price is running because it's broken above that top 
Uh, that's still 3000 will still not reflect its true fundamental value. And I did just a little quick calculation on a global basis. So here, I'll throw this out at you, Kai. Um, if you think 3000 sounded insane, how about 40000 Because somebody asked me, well, what would it take to set gold behind the currencies like we're seeing what's happening in Zimbabwe, maybe that's that's the beginning of a movement to to utilize gold to regain the public confidence in the currency, right? Well, in order to cover all of the debt that's out there on a global basis on a one-to-one -one ratio, um, which, which is probably not going to happen immediately, uh, I I would be surprised if it did. We're not ready for that yet. But in order to be at gold's fundamental value in relation to dollars and relation to the debt on a global basis, you would see spot of $40,000 an ounce. That's way, way, way higher than the 3000 But that is a reality. It is severely undervalued because it benefits the governments. With silver... Silver had been forming, I don't know how to do this in a way to show people, but in a wedge, like a wedge of cheese formation with a series of higher and higher lows and lower and lower highs. And when you get that technical formation, if it breaks above that wedge, if you kind of think about what it looks like for a wedge of cheese, when it breaks above that wedge, then it's going to jump up just like you saw gold do. So silver... Whereas as gold has finished some technical uh, formations, that cup formation, and it did break out and then it was suppressed for, to your point, a, a couple of years, they kept pushing it back. Now that has been released. And with silver, this could be, I'm not prepared to put my technical neck on the line yet on this, but this could be on their way to concluding that cup because in both cases, gold and silver are severely undervalued to their fundamental value. Absolutely. So, Lynette, maybe just to sum up in two words, it's a technical okay. breakout. Technical breakout. Yeah. Yeah. Two words. Okay. Interesting. Um, I, I wanted to share something real quick and see if I can make it happen really, really quick because uh, the World Gold Council came out with a uh, March update. So it's still a mm -hmm. bit older, but I wanted to show it and uh, especially one part. And I hope our audience can see it here on the screen as well. And uh, it's sort of analyzing the flow and the returns in gold. Of course, we've seen uh, almost 8% here in March. What, what I found the most interesting is... Uh, the, World Gold, uh, the World Gold Council attributed the breakout to momentum and to risk and uncertainty, which is the dark green and light blue. But the biggest column was unexplained in terms of, okay, why did gold drive uh, run up to 8%? So th that's that's why like, I still have a few question marks. Yes, I do believe in the technicals because I've seen other investors share that uh, that technical right. chart on, on Twitter. I think Tavi Costa was one who was really prominent about it. He's never seen a three three top or four top uh, without it breaking out, right? I'm exactly you. what you have mentioned. Exactly what you have mentioned, Lynette. And uh, now we have the World Gold Council talking about uh, unexplained moves as well. So um, it's, it's puzzling Gold a bit, right? Council, the World Gold Council, and they have, good, they have really good stuff in there, um, except that they're really more attuned to the, the fiat markets than they are understanding currency life cycles. So when I'm talking about the true value of an ounce of gold or an ounce of silver, which is far more important than whatever Wall Street is gonna say, whatever the technicals say, I mean, they work on a short-term basis, but the unexplained, I love these unexplained because are we not seeing wow I, i'm surprised that this happened in the markets or i'm surprised that that happened in the markets but there's really a very simple explanation for it all and that is because the experiment that they started back in 1913 with the fiat money system and transitioning the risk and transitioning the purchasing power well that's coming to conclusion now we are at the very end of this experiment and we need to transition or reset into the next experiment. But I want us to have a seat at the table in determining what 
that looks like because otherwise we're going back to feudal times where you know what do we do we we work for this stuff right we try and save it we try and you know plan for a retirement or education or something else we want our children to have the same kind of opportunities that we have or better opportunities and what's happening in the system is just the opposite so we can buy into right because they i'm telling you governments and central banks spend an awful lot of money on perception management that is a real program because if they can get you to think a certain way, then they can nudge, those are their terms, not mine, but they can nudge you in the direction that most benefits them. Well, I see that direction. I don't like that direction because as the World Economic Forum says, you own nothing. You going to be happy with that? I don't think so because that means you have to rent everything. And the digitization of every asset means that you can hold your wealth in an easy to spend place on your phone. And then you, it, whether you realize it or not, because again, they're nudging you in this direction, you end up spending all your equity and there they go. You volunteered your wealth and you don't even realize it. Absolutely. L Lynette, uh, the ETF still saw outflows in March. Okay. And, uh, the, the, the gold rally really started at the beginning of March. So who, who's buying gold? Is it just the central banks? No. No. <laughs> who, who's I, buying I now? Huge movement. And, you know, again, you're going back to the spot market in which it is so easy to create as much gold and silver that does not nor ever will exist before they change the formulas. And according to the Bank for International Settlements, for every one ounce of physical gold that exists in the whole world. At that time, there were 62,000 ounces of digital gold. Do you think that that might have an impact on the price that you see? Right? So don't be fooled by what Wall Street is telling you because their job is not to put your best interest first. Their job is to transfer the risk from the few, from the elites, to the many, to the public. My job is to translate that financial noise, help you put your best interests first. And, and I'm telling you, you got to have wealth. You've got to have sound money that is outside of this system. Or when the central bankers tell you to jump, you're going to have to ask how high. And I don't want them to be dictating every single move that I make or the future of my children. And, and when I say my children, I'm thinking about your children too. I'll say our children. I, I, I don't want them to have that power and that control. That's what I'm fighting for. Excellent points, Lynette. Ex excellent points. And I 100% agree with what you're saying. It makes a whole lot of sense. The question is now, since you mentioned it's a technical breakout, Mm -hmm. What what will the what will the next few I don't know months look like trading wise if we were to look at it from a more technical perspective? I know it's like you get quite emotional about hard assets and the future of money, of course. But well, if, if we were to leave emotion out out of it, like realistically, do you see a gap closing again? Because there's a massive gap from like twenty one fifty to twenty four hundred. Like what 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 is your sort of prediction there? Right, technically. All gaps must be filled. I can't tell you that they're going to be filled on Tuesday at 835, <laughs> but 100% and all that would be is potentially another opportunity. And the reason why I say potentially is because in, in any of the physical markets, while they can create as much paper as they can, and that will guide things like this is just junk silver, you know, that that will guide what happens in this market to a degree and even in this market, which is this is just kind of junk gold. And it doesn't mean that it doesn't have the same purity level. It's just a level of blemish. Right. So these very lower quality, this is 22 carats. This is 90 percent pure silver. So these this quality level is guided by what happens in the spot market, but those premiums start to expand as it gets harder to get the physical market. 
Where you see more of the truth is in the collectible market because that is a demand supply market only. And while we just had that breakout in spot gold, we had the breakout in this market, which is still actually a lower collectible market. Well, we had that breakout. I'm trying to remember the, 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 um, chart in my mind. So don't hold me to this because I don't have it in front of me, obviously. But I believe we had that breakout a year or two ago. And in the very rare market, the ultra rarities, oh crap, that broke out first. And that's at all time highs. And the reason why the ultra rarities are significant because that might be a one ounce of gold that goes for 15 million bucks. That's the area of the elites, right? I mean, how many people can afford $15 million for one ounce of gold, right? So anybody that can is likely to either be the one that writes the laws or have the ability to influence those that write the laws, but they're insiders. They know what we don't, what the general public doesn't, they're going to know much more about it. And so to me, that is far, far, far more telling because it happens much earlier than in the paper market or the digital market. That's so cheap and easy to manipulate. It doesn't mean anything. So that's why, yes, I can go technical because I am a technician. I've been doing this on some level since 1964. But when you're looking at hard assets, this is how they work because this can't go to zero. ETFs can go to zero because they sell off parts of the holdings. But it goes from undervaluation to fair valuation to overvaluation to fair valuation to undervaluation. The speed is going to vary, but it always goes in that mode because with physical gold and silver, there's always demand. It's not just one area like the fiat money markets. It's, they're both used in every single sector of the global economy. And that is really critical for people to understand. It, it's, it's easier from your stockbroker to buy the ETFs. But the ETFs are a diminishing asset. They were only created to, to mimic the spot market movement. But when you pull back and you can do this for free in stockcharts.com, go into the perf chart on the bottom. That's the relative performance chart. Put in the dollar sign G-O-L-D, a comma, and put in G-L-D. So that's the gold ETF. And you'll see this in both the gold and the silver. And then go back long term and you're going to see how it is a diminishing asset. It's a Wall Street instrument. You can't take possession. But in the physical only world, that's where you're seeing the truth of what's going on. And that's why that's the only world that personally I like to participate in. I, I don't buy bullion at, at all. I'll buy silver bullion because it's for a different function, but I don't buy gold bullion personally at all. And I haven't for a number of years. That wasn't that, always true, but it's been true for a while now. No, that makes a lot of sense. Maybe ETCs uh, a bit different than ETFs, exchange trade commodities, maybe because they're supposed to be physically backed, but uh like, unless it's sitting in a safe here that I, I can access easily without uh, having to go through three security men, uh, I wouldn't. Like, what's, what's I'm the point? telling you, if you don't hold it, you don't own it because it's just a contract. It is all counterparty risk. And it's only as good as the counterparty. And if you can only convert whatever it is that you're doing into this stuff anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter whether it's Canadian dollars, euros, it, it doesn't matter. If what you're doing can only be converted into this and this has lost all of its purchasing power, it means nothing. Absolutely flipping nothing. No, no fu fully agree there, Lynette. And uh, that's the only way to go in my opinion as well, especially since this is not, it's, it's, an, it's not an investment or it is an investment, not a trade. Right. That's that's the key. And it's, uh, it's, it's a wealth preservation tool. So, yeah, that's it's, it's exactly what it is. Policy. 
um, you know, we're not supposed to call it an investment, but quite frankly, if you hold most of your wealth in an undervalued asset that's in a long-term positive trend, hello, <laughs> and then you can take advantage of the markets to have more wealth shift your way, booty hooty, Rudy Manuti, you know what I mean? Absolutely. <laughs> I, no I, I'm, I'm with you there, Lynette. Um, but let's, let's switch the momentum just a little bit. I want to talk a bit more markets and uh, what, what our good friend, uh, Chairman Jerome Powell, has been doing and saying as of late and what he might be doing uh, you know, in, in relation or in regard to gold, um, actually. Because mm -hmm. if we're looking at the gold price, I'm actually quite puzzled how well it is performing given that uh, bond yields are dropping, uh, or meaning rising. The bonds are dropping, yeah. yields are rising. The dollar bonds is extremely dropping. strong. All right, right. So, are rising, bonds are dropping, market value. Yeah. So, but uh, in, given that, usually, especially also in a higher rate environment, and it seems like the Fed hinted at least that it might hike again, mm -hmm. uh, although mm -hmm. seemingly unlikely if you want to look at the Fed watch tool, for example. But uh, given that environment and the strong U.S. economy, gold is doing phenomenally well. So now we got to rattle the cage here a little bit and uh, maybe – you know, scratch off the foundation there, um, which uh, the other markets are built on. Like, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the U.S. economy and what Jerome Powell is doing. Yesterday, he came out, I think it was a U.S.-Canada business commercial conference. I, I forgot the name of it, where he was talking. But uh, he, he said, well, we might have higher for longer. Um, and instead of gold going down, gold actually went up or at least remained flat. Um, let, let, let's talk about the interest rates. Uh, where, where do you see them headed? Like, uh, given the economic strength of the U.S., for example, right now? Well, first of all, you got to understand that the job of Jerome Powell, just like Janet Yellen, just like anybody that has a face is that is in some level of political office, their job is to keep you in the system and to keep you calm. So if their lips are moving, they're lying. Okay, you need to really be clear on that. Their job is not to support you. It's to support the system that that they created that keeps them in power. So um, I seriously question the real strength of the economy, because what they're really saying here is, you know, Jerome Powell says, well, look at this. We raised rates. We're tightening. But if you go into the Federal Reserve Economic Department, the FRED, F-R-E-D, everybody can access that. And you go into, just in the search bar, financial conditions, you are going to see that the real tightening is just jawboning, but conditions, uh, financial conditions have been as loose as they've ever been almost. So... You know, that discovers the lie to begin with, with their own data. So how strong is the economy? Well, what makes an economy strong, according to central bankers and governments, is the ability to borrow more money. So you have the consumers that they're depending upon. And this is not just true in the U.S. This is really, they're counting on it on a global basis. Look at China. They're looking for the consumer to support all of these debt yields and, and all of this. And what I find super interesting is that the treasury bond, which is the foundation of the global financial system and has proven illiquid since 2015 was the first flash crash in it. And we've had several more since then. It's like the foundation of a house. If you've got a house and this foundation is moving like this, which is what's happening with the interest rates and with the, with the demand in the treasury bond market, are you going to stay in that house while the foundation's going like this? Or are you going to flip and get out? So when they talk about the interest rates, a lot of it is jawboning, and the theory is, why in the world would you want to hold gold when you can get interest from a debt instrument? Well, my question to you is, why would you risk 100% of your principal for a measly 5% interest that is constantly losing value because of inflation that they created? And didn't they, but, oops, and not working. <laughs> We've and seen it in action before, Lynette. 
<laughs> Sorry about that. Well, you know, just like the central bank, if it doesn't work here, they'll figure out another way to do it, right? They'll just call it something else. They'll just get right. And, you know, so, so I think it's really important when we're looking at interest rates that if you, if you go back to any of the Federal Reserve maps, I mean, you know, the Fred is probably one of my favorite sites because I think it's more, a little bit more honest because who goes there? But you'll see these gray bars and the gray bars indicate recessions, official recessions, which, which they get to declare. And what you're going to see is their attempt to raise rates. This is was a 40 year pattern, right? Every time we'd run into a recession, boom, they would drop those rates eh, five and a half to five and three quarter percent. And then down the road, thank you. They would attempt to raise those rates, right? And every time they raise those rates, that would push us into another recession because corporations and individuals are dying. They're, they're, they're smothered in the level of debt that you either have to service you got to roll over, you got to pay off, or you're going to default. And so we're seeing a lot of defaults now spiking because of these interest rates that, you know, I mean, it is interesting to see gold spike when them with, with them holding interest rates this high because it isn't working the way they're used to it working. Why? Because we're at the end of the cycle, Right. I mean, how many times have you heard an official come out and be shocked at the behavior of the market or shocked at this behavior, shocked at that? Well, whoa, this isn't working like it's supposed to. Well, that's because we're at the end. So, nope, it's not going to work the same way when you still had ramp room. And they're, they're, I mean, I'm not saying they can't make something else up, but all they really have are interest rates and printing money. And every time they print more money, it just makes the money that's already out there have less and less purchasing power value. We're, we're at the end. That's why you got to have sound money. I mean, it, it, it's not rocket science. It's simple. You got to hold your purchasing power intact while we make this transition. Then you can convert into the new money once if you trust it or you convert it as you need it, right? And you're in a much better position to continue to feed your family. But but this is really the importance. I think we started talking about this um, the end of January, the last time, is the importance of community, both locally because things get very, when you go into hyperinflation, things get very, very local for a while. And uh, my good friend, George Gammon, just did a video in Argentina and saying nobody down there wants gold or Bitcoin. I mean, they could convert gold. They took a discount, but they could convert gold. Nobody wanted the cryptocurrency at all. But what, he's, what he was kind of missing in there is it always depends on where you are in the trend cycle. Your first line of defense is always cash simply because that's what people are more accustomed to. We've been trained away from this as money or, oops, or this as money. But in hyperinflation, when the inflation is moving very rapidly, pu the public notices that. They notice it. And then they lose trust in it. This is your second line of defense. This is your third line of defense. So... It's layers based upon where we are in the trend cycle. Is that how you would explain why the US dollar or the Dixie I'm looking at is still at 106? So it's still actually fairly strong and it's gone up in, in recent months to 106. So, you know, a bit of a contra indicator and it almost seems like... Uh, we call it like moronic that that that's happening. So, like, I'm curious if that if that's that indicator. Is it really that safe haven buying uh, that that first line of defense that you've mentioned that we're witnessing in the in the dollar right now? It it is only uh, the first the I didn't say a safe line of defense. I said the first line of defense. Those are two different things, um, and it's only because they're more comfortable with that. But I'm so glad you brought up the strong dollar. 
because in that, Fred, pull up the purchasing power chart, right? What they're talking about is relative, right? The dollar is stronger against the Japanese yen as a great example, which is trading at the lowest level since the 90s, the 80s, where have you. But in both of those cases, whether you're looking at the dollar or the yen, inflation, because that's what the Japanese government, they've been fighting deflation. And, and can you scroll over because it looks like it flattens out. But if you um, actually, yes, there you go. Look at that, right? You can see quite clearly that the purchasing power of the dollar is continuing to go down to zero, right? Just like, just like this is a two hundred thousand dollar dong, Vietnamese dong. What can you buy with this? Absolutely nothing, right? Doesn't matter how many of these you have. What matters is what you can convert it into, which is which is pretty much what what George was talking about when he was in um, Argentina, Argentina just just recently. People don't want gold or silver or cryptos. They want the goods and services that you can buy with that. And the difference between this, well, what's the difference between? doesn't matter. This is 500 million bolivars. And it has more value as a napkin for an empanada than it does to buy anything with. But this always has value. This always has value. Why? Why? Well, because these are used in one place, the fiat money place. These are used in every single sector of the global economy, period. So you have no functionality here and, and, you know, or just one place and you have pure functionality here because much as they have attempted to recreate the same qualities of gold and silver in the labs, they have been unable to do it. So this has full demand. This requires a government to say it's money and therefore they can say no, no longer money. But this is real money that's globally accepted because no there's alchemy. full functionality and full demand. Yeah, alchemy doesn't work. That's why I don't like diamonds anymore, to be honest. Like, unless they're for engagement rings, I'm not a fan of diamonds. I used to think, like, I can just, you know, buy diamonds, stuff them in my socks and run across borders. Uh, but uh, I can't tell the difference. I'm not an expert. I don't live in, what is it, Antwerp, where, where all the experts live. I'd be I'd be lost. You can easily dupe me, but uh, with gold, still fairly fool foolproof. You know, unless you fall for the fool's gold, which is pyrite. So, is, um, and I'm I'm going to do something on how you tell. But generally, neither gold nor silver are magnetic. So even if you happen to carry a nice strong magnet around with you, and you want to test is this real or not, a real simple test, see if it's magnetic. If it's magnetic, it's not pure gold and silver. Absolutely. No, then it's uh, just lead covered in uh, something. <laughs> right. So, no, fantastic. L L Lynette, you've uh, done a video recently, six days ago, roughly, about pattern changes. And I'm just yes. curious, um, like, Dude. what are some of the biggest shifts and uh, that, that you've witnessed re just, just recently um, as part of pattern that, that are changing in the economy and globally in general? Let me count the ways. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Number one, there is a, a, a marked increase in the monetary velocity. So the monetary, it, it's, it's monetary M2, money supply two velocity. That's huge because what that tells me, this is my opinion, we'll find out if I'm right. That tells me that, that the speed at which money is changing hands has really been picking up, which is exactly what happens in hyperinflation. So I'm putting my neck on the line and I'm saying, I believe that has already begun. Number two, we have, and this is huge, we have been watching over since 2008, a synchronized move in the global central banks, but no more. We just recently had Switzerland as an advanced economy. I think they lowered the interest rates. They were the first advanced economy to lower the rates, 
right? So where we've had synchronized central bank moves, now we have some not advanced economies raising rates, but they're not synchronized anymore. That is jive flipping enormous. That's ginormous to watch them no longer be synchronized because that's an accident waiting to happen. And another huge shift, though this one started in June of 2022, but it has become absolutely apparent right now, kind of like what you were talking about with the breakout in the spot market, kind of like what you were talking about with the higher interest rates with with uh, Jerome Powell, usually higher for longer interest rates mean that the stock market is going to pull back because it's more expensive to keep all that debt. I mean, there's a huge wall of debt that's coming due this year, next year, or the following year, most of it this year and next year. So typically with a higher interest rates, you would expect the stock market to pull back. But now the markets are fighting the Fed. That old saying, don't fight the Fed, you know, well, the markets are fighting the Fed. So there are three ginormous shifts. And I think if I thought a little bit more, I could come up with even more. But those three mean that there is an accident waiting to happen. And even though, you know, you could say, well, Lynette, you've been talking about these, the reset and all that. I started calling it a reset in 2009 after I listened to an interview on Bloomberg, which they've subsequently taken down with Christine Lagarde, who was the head of the IMF at that time. And it was like a 20 minute interview. And I think she used the term reset, how everything needed to reset like 28 times. And I went, holy crap, that's where we are. I knew the system died in 2008. But I've been, so I've been talking about the reset since 2009. And honestly, technicals are so much smarter than I am. But, you know, my daddy used to tell me, do what I say and not what I do, which never made sense to me. So I listen to what they say and then I watch what they do. They're saying everything is hunky-dory. Look at how strong the U.S. economy is. Look at how strong the U.S. consumer is. The whole global economy, oh, la, 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 la. But then what are global central banks doing? They're buying more gold than they ever have before. They're positioning into sound money so that they can retain their choices and their freedoms, which is exactly the same reason why you and I need to have sound money. 100% Lina, 100% agree and uh, the velocity of money I pulled up that chart on the Fred again let me uh, just share my screen real quick again yeah, the MV2 um, if you put that in the search bar that'll come up well, I got I got th I think that's the one you're looking for is that, that is that is a pervasive move up that is flipping pervasive. Now you look at what happened. I think it peaked in 97. So it was at 97 was the last time that is that 97? Yeah, Q3 97 was at 2.2 okay. roughly. Perfect. That is the last time when taking on more debt actually stimulated the economy. And it was worse. You can see that there's just that downward spike. And you can see the difference. Even when there was an upward move, not as pervasive, not as uh, not a move up as, as powerful as the one that's happening right now. You, any, any of those little upward moves, you can see this is now pervasive. And why I'm saying, I believe there's seriously, plus I've studied currency life cycle since 87. There isn't one doubt in my mind and I could be wrong. I mean, you know, all of this stuff is way beyond my control, but I would venture to say that that is not a good sign <laughs> and that we are at the beginning of hyperinflation and therefore we're running out of time. Get it done. Get it done. In inflation is one topic I quickly wanted to touch on. You, you keep using the word hyperinflation. And uh, of course, I have to look at the data that is coming out. And uh, by the BLS, I think Bureau of Labor Statistics is putting out the inflation. Is it BLS? I might be confusing things. But uh, three consecutive quarters of rising inflation. And the, the trend, is that going to continue? Like, of course, you're predicting hyperinflation. The question is how fast? 
I think, the, the velocity of that inflation. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. I got this super <laughs> magic ball here. When is that hyperinflation going to hit? Answer unclear. Ask again later. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> we'll, we'll do that when we see each other soon. Well, um, Yes, but, but you have to understand that the only difference between inflation and hyperinflation is the speed of that inflation. And when you are all out of bullets like the Fed is, all they have left are dropping those interest rates down and printing more money. That's all they have left, right? So when Ernest Hemingway was asked, how is it that you went bankrupt? He said, slowly at first and then fast. And so really what we see happening, and, and this impacts, it, it'll impact the world, but it impacts the U.S. more than anybody else, is new financial plumbing being put in place. Right now, the global financial plumbing is based upon the U.S. dollar and the treasury, the U.S. treasury bonds, but they're putting the new financial plumbing of rapid payments and, and a shift into the new system, which is more than likely to be, um, well, what they're working toward, very obviously, is a one world currency. And so we'll have this umbrella that's, I personally, I, I've been saying this since 2009, we're going to find out, I'm either going to be right or I'm going to be wrong. But I believe it will be the IMF's SDR, Special Drawing Rights, because that is a basket of currencies without limits. So they could put every single currency in that basket, kind of like what Zimbabwe is attempting to do with a currency basket with a component of gold because, because the confidence, the public confidence in the currency in the system has been lost. So they're attempting to regain it. But we'll have one overarching currency with what the biz is proposing. One ledger, one ledger to control everything, to keep all the data in one place, which is so much easier to control, or separate ledgers that are all interlocked, but still, again, controlled by one entity. And I personally think that entity is going to be the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, because the members are all treasury secretaries and central bank chiefs, all unelected officials, I might point out. But if it's a basket of currencies, we can have that one umbrella currency, which they're working on, and then that can easily be translated into a local currency. So say in the US, a digital dollar or a digital euro, which everybody's working on voraciously. But once that new plumbing is in place and the bricks have started that, et cetera, et cetera, and they turn that switch out of the U.S. dollar plumbing system into whatever the new CBDC brick system is going to be, boom, just like that, you better be ready because you're not going to have any warning. Yeah, that Fed coin is going to be an interesting implementation. It is coming very soon as well. So we'll, we'll have to watch this is, that. This is around the world. This isn't a U.S. centric issue. This is a global issue. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I mean, that's why, and I think we talked about this, but seriously, I found my real voice and my, my voice, and it's about community when I did those events in Australia because we have to come together locally to be able to sustain a reasonable standard of living unless you have the time and the money and the effort to do what I've done, which is food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter. But we don't have that luxury anymore. So we have to go out and meet your local farmers markets, get to know the people that create your food, that, that have water, that have all of these things and get involved, get to know them. But globally, so we have a seat at the table to the new monetary system. We have to, we have to really vote with our wallets, vote with our purses by positioning into physical gold and silver. We can have a peaceful revolution if we just do that. And that, if you have all of your bases covered, the food, water, et cetera, covered, and you have sound money, when those central banks say jump, you can say, nope, 
You're going to retain your freedom. You're going to retain your choices for not just you, but for our children. And that's really my bad. I'm old. You know, I'm going to be 70 this year. I'll be around for, I think, another 30 years or so. But it's my children and my grandchildren and, and my great grandchildren that aren't even born. That's what this battle is about. And that's why it's so critically important. With uh, being being a father myself, I fully agree with your points there, Lynette. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Like, there's there's no arguing with it. And um, one question escaped my mind. Uh, I have a couple actually, but uh, the one that's probably most fitting to, to what you just mentioned is, if if the BRICS or any other country were to produce a gold backed currency, a proper one that you could trust in, that would actually be backed by gold. Would that immediately overnight be the new world reserve currency? Wouldn't all the money in the world or anybody that has two brain cells jump onto that opportunity and buy that money and uh, stock up? Well, God, goodness gracious, we're getting that test right now with Zimbabwe, aren't we? I flip and love it. You know, you've, you've, these things happen in out of the way places so that we get to, because living in this country, oh, well, that's Zimbabwe, that can never happen here, or that's Argentina, that can, yes, this is, this is all around the world, and you would think that, but here's the key, here is the key, and I want everybody to know this, because whenever a government is trying to regain, and central bank is trying to regain the confidence, 100% of the time, over 4,800 times, what do they do? They put a component of gold in there. Any government can say it's backed by gold. How do you know if it really is? It must be convertible into the gold. Back in the day when the public had control, right? You could walk into any bank with this and walk out with this. That pulled the gold from the system and created limitations around what a government can do. If it's not convertible, it ain't the end, right? So I don't care if they say that it's backed by Zimbabwe, like what, about a year and a half ish ago, something like that. They came out with a one ounce gold coin. And of course, only the elite people in their system could afford this. And they said it's to protect the purchasing power. Well, then they came out with a, a gold-backed CBDC. And what was interesting is when I go in to try and find the stats on that, I can find the stats on how many people bought the physical gold coins, how much of that they're moving. But I can't really find any breakout of the CBDCs because the public doesn't trust that there's actually the gold there, right? They said it is. It's backed by it. And again, just recently, they came out with... Uh, a cur their newest currency, and I believe this might be their sixth iteration or something. I could be off, but on that, the sixth iteration of currency, now it's a basket with a component of gold. And yet when I was digging to find out, okay, so what currencies are in their, comp their, their basket and what percentages of it are in the currency and what percentage of gold is in the, I couldn't find it. And I dug and dug and dug. Maybe I'm looking in the wrong place. And our Lord knows I will continue to try. But we're going to have an absolutely perfect way to find out what that response will be. Right? Um, unless it's convertible, though, for me, it, it, it's not the end. So they can say anything they want. The proof is in the pudding. And why is all that? I would think those stats would not be so hidden. That that should be really easy to find what makes up their currency. What what currencies are in there? How much gold is in there? And I can't find it. So that's you why I said reliably backed by gold, for example. Reliable. Right. That's like I personally I would never even consider buying anything coming out of Zimbabwe right now. Like there's no track record of success or trustworthiness. Absolutely not. So um, but is there anywhere? Tell me what government and what central bank you actually trust to put your best interests first. Oh, none of them. Like that, that I think that's, that's, uh, we'll have to go by who's the closest. Okay. <laughs> like, and, uh, oh, or like that, who, who aligns most with my principles at best. Like, and uh, that's not even close. Like, well, you can't even look at their principles because they don't really, I mean, 
There, there have, is a massive gap. And, <laughs> and I'm there not trying to mm -mm about this, but they look at those levels. They have to find sociopaths to do this job because they cannot care about how their their what their choices and what their policies do, how that impacts m the masses. They they can't. So. I would imagine, Kai, because I know you're a man of high integrity, that there isn't going to be any central banker that can align with your personal principles. And I know that's true for me. Not one. They have a job to do and they're doing their job and their job is to protect the banks and their system. And the government's job is to protect itself, not the citizens. We have to become our own central bankers. We have to come together in community to support and help each other through this. And we have to vote with our wallets so we have a seat at the table. I think you've been talking too much with Gregory Menorino or he too much with you because he used the exact same sentence. You have to become your own central banker. And I know you, I, and uh, I've seen you do an interview with him recently and I interviewed him a few, a, a couple of weeks ago as well. And he used that same exact sentence, which is really, really interesting. Um, Lynette, it's like, I want to use the last maybe five minutes here just to break down the last two points of your pattern changes that you made. One was, uh, yes. you know, the, the, the central banks are not in sync anymore. And I was going to ask you, um, the US versus the, the Eurozone, the EU, it seems like there is a bit yes. of a game of chicken being played. Um, who, who moves first? Because uh, I think that'll have interesting implications and ramifications for the, for the financial system of either economy. If you were a batting person, then maybe we can consult your eight ball again. But uh, who's going to move first? Let's see. <laughs> Wow, that answer is still unclear. <laughs> but whoever does, you're right. The repercussions from it are going to be ginormous because it's been the Fed that's been leading the pack. It's actually been the Bank of Japan. That, that's the reality. The Bank of Japan have been running all of these experiments since the early 90s. And, you know, and what do they do? They double down. So part of and I, I don't think you're going to be able to answer it. Certainly, I can't answer this question. We make the assumption that they want to kick the can down the road, that they want to postpone the inevitable. And I contend that maybe they are still working together behind the scenes to create this next crisis that will be that are happening and all other things, the, the vulnerability in the grid, et cetera, to create a big enough crisis to get people into their, the next iteration of money and give them more control. And that's why we can't wait. We, we have to get into position, you know, right now, because these are all accidents that are waiting to happen and maybe they're intentional accidents. Lynette, I could chat with you for hours because the Bank of Japan is a whole different uh, topic that we could discuss, <laughs> like the, the yen carry trade. And you touched on liquidity earlier. I've had a great discussion with Michael Howell the other day, the king of liquidity on that topic. What does that really mean if, if this Japanese central bank, the BOJ, starts raising rates? Will exactly. money leave the system? What will it do to the U.S.? And based on what I've seen during those central bank meetings, I think there was one last year, I think it was in Portugal, where the Japanese... Uh, president of the central bank, uh, Chairman Powell and uh, Lagarde sat together and they seemed awfully chummy. So um, they seemed I'm like saying. really good friends. Right. Then, you know, everybody at the IMF is either the head of the central bank. Well, they're not either. They are both the head of the central bank and the treasury secretaries. They get together all the time. You think they're not talking about this stuff? Yeah, of course they are. Third, third point you made, the market is fighting the Fed. Yes. And every lesson I learned, at least as a gold investor, when we fought the Fed, we usually lost or we got whacked in the head or whacked over the, oh, <laughs> whacked over the head. You bring See? the worst out of me, Lynette. Um, and uh, like it usually you, you can't win fighting the Fed. So don't stop fighting the Fed. Go with the flow. Um, so I'm curious, like, when does the market get whacked over the head? Like, how, how much higher can stocks rise? Like the current melt-up? Like what, what does the Fed have to do or the markets have to do for, for that trend to change? Well, well, for one thing, you know, you're, you're making the assumption that they actually wanted to change where I'm saying perhaps 
what we're actually seeing in these technicals is that the central bank is being a little bit overwhelmed. And, you know, even though that was the adage was don't fight the Fed, if indeed the Fed is out of tools, as are all the central banks, because they just have the interest rates and the money printing to go, the bigger issue that would absolutely 100% overwhelm the Fed's ability to print their way out of this mess are the derivatives against which all of those debt instruments and interest rates and et cetera are, are based, just these big, fat bets that you can't convert into anything. So is this, I go back to, is this intentional or is it coincidental? Who knows? Um, but what we might be seeing in this battle is that the markets have the ability to overwhelm the central bank's ability to bail this out because now they're warring. And who's going to win this battle? I, I would not be prepared to say the central bank will win it. I'm not prepared to say Wall Street would win it. Um, I could tell you who's going to lose it. And that's all the public. The consumer. Yeah. The short end of the stake. We've seen that too many times. Like in the end, it's either higher taxes or uh, we're just losing all our wealth. <laughs> we, or we can't access it. So fantastic. Lynette. Wonderful conversation. Can't believe it's been 55 minutes we've been chatting. I could, as I said, I could go on with you forever. It's it's always a great, great pleasure to, to catch up with you. Um, where can we find more of your work? Where can we follow you nowadays? Well, I, I'm really, we're working very hard on our YouTube channel. I'd say that's the biggest place and it's at the Lynette Zhang. Also on Twitter at the Lynette Zhang. Instagram and Facebook are both the ampersand or the, the at Lynette Zhang. So that's where you can find me. We should, our website should be open by the end of this month and we'll be in a position to start exercising and utilizing the strategy that I developed that's based upon these repeatable patterns. It's not rocket science, but we're working hard to be available for frankly, all of our clients to come and help us. But the YouTube channel is where we're focusing all of most of our energy we're, we're juggling a lot of balls right now but most of the energy is into the youtube channel i, I could see that you put out 62 videos or so in a very short time and fantastic content i might add as well so thank you really really well done and uh, congrats on that and uh thank you so much for joining me thank you so much and uh everybody else thank you so much for tuning in i hope you enjoyed this conversation with Lynette zhang as much as i have you could tell like she always brings me out gets me out of my shell it always gets uh more emotional get i get more excited you see a lot more hand waving and arm waving i hope you enjoyed this please leave a comment leave a like make sure to subscribe to the channel i'm tremendously thankful for everybody who supports us and uh, that way we can grow our reach we can bring guests like lynette on the channel more frequently and other great guests of course as well we really appreciate it and uh, i love the constructive feedback you've been giving us as i said we're doing this for you and uh, we're trying to be educational of course we're not giving investment advice we're just trying to educate you but uh, if you find this informative let us know and of course we're always trying to do a better job so if you have some criticism put it down below we want to hear from you we can take it we're german and uh, we appreciate it thank you so much for tuning in we'll be back with lots lots more here shortly on soar financially